In many European countries, the organizations of the rescaled movement advocate for the replacement of prisons with small-scale detention houses. In the Barrier Breaking Livestreams, we explore the different barriers to reach that goal. And today we explore political support. Only if there is enough political support, good ideas can become good policies. But getting political support is not always easy. How do you get it on the agenda? How do you make it mainstream? And how do you find politicians that are not afraid to alienate hard on crime voters and dare to become real change makers? Today we look at Belgium. Small scale detention is becoming mainstream from the left to the centre right. Houses made it to the coalition agreement of the new government and two houses will be opened this year alone. What is the secret to the success? Is it durable? And what can other countries learn from this example? This we ask to three flag bearers of small scale detention houses in Belgium who have played a crucial role in getting here. They are not the outside lobbyists or activists, but the key players themselves, politicians and policy makers. Welcome to a barrier breaking live stream, political support. Small scale detention houses can add value to the criminal justice system. This is recognized by the government because detention houses enable restoration improve reintegration and differentiate an individually tailored approach. The written support is there. Are policymakers ready? Let's ask them. And this event consists of two parts. In the first part, we ask our guests their experience and perspective on how political support is created. And in the second part, we discuss two dilemmas the reskilled movement faces in creating political support. And we ask their advice. And then we also do a Q&A with our speakers where we can have all your questions to them. My name is Roger Elshout. I'm a moderator of events by profession. I'm from the Netherlands, so I'm an outsider enough to ask all these questions. But I'm also a board member of Rescale Europe, so I'm insider enough to know what we're talking about. And this episode is organized by the Belgium chapter and the founding fathers, I may say, of the Rescaled, the Huizen. Manu Pintelon is a criminologist and the Belgian coordinator of Rescaled, and together with Noah Shozan, he is the organizer of this event. Manu, why do we need to talk about political support? Why is Belgium a good case study? And when is this event success for you? Thank you very much, Rohir. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the live stream of Rescaled Belgium. We are so glad you are joining us today. As Rohir already said, today is about the obstacle political support for detention houses. We have three very interesting speakers who can give us some crucial insights into political support. We will listen to their story and how they are confronted with this topic of detention houses in the past, nowadays, and existing future plans, especially about political support. Is there political support in Belgium? How do you create political support? And if there is a support base, who or what is that precisely? A very difficult topic, topic, but I'm sure our speakers, uh, with their different angle of approach, can give us some logical insights and maybe even provide us with some very important information. I will now take first the time to briefly introduce our three speakers more in detail. Um, who are they and why are they so interesting regarding detention houses? And um, here we go. So on the first screen, you will see Stefan van Hecke. He is a member of the Belgian Federal Parliament for the Ecological Party here. Van Hecke is known for his expertise on justice, as he is a member of the Justice Committee since 2007. As he strongly believes in the concept of reskilled, Van Hecke has devoted time and energy to help build up a political support base for detention houses. He will definitely share with us today his experience and how the political support base for detention houses has changed through the years. On the second screen, we will see Kuhn Haynes. Kuhn Haynes is a former Minister of Justice and Deputy Prime Minister in the governments of Charles Michel and Sophie Gomez. As a Minister of Justice, he put small-scale uh, detention on the Belgian map. He created and implemented the concept of transition houses. This is a, a detention house for people at the end of their sentence. Therefore, he needed political support so he can tell us more about how that went and how that was created. On the third screen, we will see Mathilde Steenbaum. She was prison director and worked as justice and prison advisor and is now director of the justice policy cell of our Minister of Justice, Vincent van Quickenborn. It is her policy cell that includes detention houses in the policy note, and this has helped emphasize political support. Mathilde Steenbergen will give us information about the current policy and can tell us something or 
what support she needs from the political landscape to implement detention houses. Um, unfortunately, our fourth speaker, Paul Magnet, couldn't make it uh, last minute. But there's overall a special thanks to all three panelists to be here today and uh, to share their knowledge with us. Let's now give the floor first to our founding father, Hans Klaus, who will tell you something more about the way he experienced political support for detention houses over the year and why we need this support so badly. I hope you enjoy every second of it. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see so many interested in the future of detention houses. A special thanks to our panelists and the people who organized this event. I am Hans Klaus, prison director and artist. I'm the founder of Visit with the Huizen, and I, together with others, developed the concept of detention houses. As many of you already know, we present detention houses as a solution for old prison concept. In time, we would like to replace all prisons with small scale detention houses that are integrated in the community. This would be a detention concept that fits our 21st century and our current expectations of the deprivation of liberty. Today, however, we will not focus on the concept of detention houses as such, but on the political support for our concept. We can propose whatever we want, but will it ever happen? People have told me politicians are not interested in the way incarcerated people are treated because they cannot win votes with it. Even if they do, in this era of budget cutting, they surely will not risk their career by advocating to spend more money on it. You cannot ask them to change the paradigm of punishment into more civilized forms when the trend in society is to be tougher on crime. These were all things I heard when I was launching the campaign to change prisons into small-scale detention houses. In short, practitioners and scientists have been crying for fundamental change for a long time, but there only ever seems to exist room for minor marginal interventions, such as better training for staff, or of course, building new prisons. However, the choice to make a real shift in punishment remains a political choice. And in a representative democracy, this choice is up to politicians. That's why the Belgian project of the Huizen of the Huizen started by contacting politicians from 2011 to 2012. In the initiative of our movement, politicians gathered in a strategic, strategic working group and designed the features of what is now an ongoing process in making a fundamental change. Why did they do so? And moreover, how do they proceed? Their story can inspire rescaled movement that is advocating our paradigm shift in other European countries. I'm so glad they are willing to share their views and their experience at the local level as a minister of justice, as member of parliament in the opposition or within majority, as president of a political party, or as a political advisor. This can be so educational for all of us. Let's get the debate started and let's find out how policymakers think about our concept. In which way is it already integrated in their current policy? I hope everyone enjoys our event and remember to keep advocating for structural change because that would definitely bring us a better penitentiary future. Mr. Van Hecke, you are a member of parliament for uh, Groen, the ecological party. Um, you are a long serving member of the justice committee. Uh, you have survived many governments uh, in Belgium. Uh, and I've been told you are uh, sometimes called the Wikipedia of the justice committee. You are supposed to know everything. Um, and um, yeah, I've been told you have played a crucial role in, in putting this on the agenda and getting it from a fringe ID into the mainstream of politics. 
when did it start? What was the moment that you first heard of detention houses and why did it appeal to you so much? Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone uh, on the screen. Good afternoon, everyone, and special thank you for the organizers of uh, this webinar. Um, I'm very delighted with this uh, invitation and I'm here to outline the, the, the long journey we have traveled in Parliament during the last decade. Our goal has been to put that beautiful and strong idea of detention houses on the political agenda and, and try to realize it. But uh, Mr. Van Hecke, do you remember the year when it started? How many years already are you involved yeah. in small-scale detention? It must have been uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and then I had contact with Hans Klaus, of course. Uh, we saw him. Uh, I think he's a little bit the, fa the founding father of the, of the idea here in, in, in Belgium. Uh, and I accepted the challenge to support uh, the ideas via what he called uh, a strategy working group of the housing, the Heusen. Um, but I can say I was not alone there because 10 years ago, who was invited also around the table, that's the present Minister of Justice, Meer van Quickenborne. Also 10 years ago, we found each other uh, around the table with Hans Klaus discussing about that, that idea and how we could try to realize it in Belgium. So it's uh, about 10 years that we are years. trying to, to work on it. Wow, that's uh, okay. And you have you prepared a presentation of a little overview of the last 10 years, what happened and what were the key factors for success. Uh, second, we have this Koen Geentjer, the Member of Parliament for CD&V, the Christian Democratic Party of, uh, of Flanders. Uh, till, till last year, you were Minister of Justice for four years uh, and you are the founding father of transition houses in Belgium. Um, uh, there were none in Belgium when you started, now there are uh, two, and you even put in the law that uh, people in detention have the right to apply for a transition house, so a house between prison and their release into society, uh, and they can apply for it, and if they meet the conditions, they, uh, they, they might go to one. Where does your enthusiasm for small-scale detention come from? Well, I'm not the founding father to start with. I, I, I'm only the one who signed the law, which during six years I was allowed to do as a Minister of Justice. Um, when I arrived at the Justice Department in, in 2014, um, the idea of Hans Klaus was vivid, but was controversial. Um, the penitentiary administration certainly was not 100% enthusiastic about the idea. Um, from a lot of points of view, but uh, certainly also from a practical point of view. Um, but there was a lot of support in, in civil society, mostly the left side of civil society. I'm in the center, so that's a good thing to start with. And um, we uh, thought that um, with some small experiments uh, to start with, the idea might maybe gain um, applause uh, at the end of the day. And so it took us five years um, to have the law enacted for two transition houses um, that only uh, apply the concept um, to the phase between prison and return to society, the last 18 months, in fact. So it is, it is a reduction of the idea, but uh, in order to um, make people acquainted with the idea, that is what uh, we did. Okay, and so for you also specifically, we'll ask you later um, how to get from, from will to policy that's really implemented, because an idea is one thing, but a policy that works uh, is another thing, and that's where your expertise comes. Uh, Mathilde Steenbergen, you're the director of the Justice Policy Cell of the Minister of Justice in Belgium. So you're a member of his cabinet, which is something in the Netherlands we don't have. You're either a politician or a civil servant. What are you? Are you a politician or a civil servant? Um, I'm, uh, I'm both. <laughs> I'm uh, a civil servant who is, uh, the, who is in a temporary leave um, to help the Minister of Justice. Yes. So uh, how free are you to talk about uh, all your opinions or are you supposed to say what the minister's opinions are? Oh, uh, in, internally, I am free to speak uh, as I wish. Um, 
in uh, situations like this, uh, yeah, I have to be loyal to my boss, but uh, I have to be honest, my boss and I have uh, completely the same opinion about this topic, so it will be difficult for me. As uh, Stefan said, um, Vincent van Quickenborn was also around the table already 10 years ago. I was, I think, around another table. I don't remember near Stefan van Eck and near Vincent van Quickenborn <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, I didn't know them uh, by then. Um, I was also around the table with um, Hans Klaus, but as a, as a civil servant at that time. Wow. Uh, you will specifically give a little bit more detail about the policies of the current government and also all the uh, difficulties and uh, political support that you need to implement it within the services that we have. Um, wonderful. Um, so um, we are going to start uh, with uh, Mr. Van Hecke. Um, yeah, you have uh, prepared a little presentation also for us in, from how do you get from uh, the idea that made, uh, together with a few people uh, you designed and how to get into mainstream politics that doesn't only appeal to people on the left side of the spectrum but all across the political spectrum and, uh, and politicians not only saying they want it but really wanting it. Uh, I would say uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I have made a little presentation to make it more uh, to, to, to make it some beautiful pictures and, and the best moments in the last 10 years. Um, so in this uh, process, two things have always been important uh, to me and, and still are. The first is creating a, a political support basis. And the second is working on a, a social support basis. And these two elements will be the basis of what I want to explain to you uh, today. So let me start with the, the political uh, support. If we as policymakers go down this road of small scale and, and differentiation, we need a broad political support base in order to achieve it. Uh, this has been necessary for the creation of a capacity for, for 100 people in 2017 by uh, Mr. Justice Kuhn Gaines at that present. Um, why is this political support so crucial? There are, in fact, two re main reasons for me. First of all, because the outline of a detention policy requires long-term thinking. And secondly, because continuity over changes in composition of governments is necessary. Changes in composition could lead to different and more uh, destructive choices. So that continuity is very important. In other words, if we want to realize this policy of small scale uh, facilities, it has to be done across successive governments and across the parliament and as broadly as possible across the boundaries of majority and opposition. And that is why I have always welcomed any step uh, towards uh, more differentiation and detention, even when I was part of the opposition in the parliament. At this time, we are, in, uh, we are no longer in opposition, um, but also in government. And I will keep on doing so uh, as well. Over the last decade, there have been three important steps, I think. And the first, the first step was in 2012. Uh, an interesting fact is that politicians were able to find each other across party lines in October 10th, 2012, after uh, many discussions with, with various parties in the parliament, a proposal for a resolution saw the light. And this proposal contained a pilot project of uh, differentiated administration of uh, sentences. It was signed by representatives of several political parties from left and right wing, including uh, myself. And this uh, resolution was, uh, was never debated or voted on in the commission uh, at that time, uh, but uh, we had already a broad coalition uh, who was preparing to work on, on this uh, topic. Then we have the second step. The second step was in, in 2017. And if we look at the composition of, of the government at that time, which was a government that, that approved what they call the master plan, uh, the third master plan, uh, and just also the choice to establish the so-called transition houses, we can see how this political support was already there in 2017 across majority and opposition uh, boundaries. The uh, establishment of the transition houses made 2000, 2017 an important uh, year. Even though this decision was justifiable, it was 
still very courageous of the Justice Minister Kuhn Geens, like he, he told us already, who announced this pro project at a, pre a press conference in January uh, 2017. And then the third important moment, uh, I think, is, uh, is now. Uh, I am I'm proud and I'm glad at the same time that the current government is continuing along this path uh, as well. When the coalition agreement was um, drawn up, the question whether or not detention houses should be established was in fact no longer a political issue. The proposal even passed in a first version without uh, any problem. The path was already chosen and would not be uh, reversed. That such a decision would have passed without any problems would simply not have been possible 10 years ago. And the current coalition agreement states, uh, I quote, in cooperation with the federal states, the federal government creates the necessary framework so that the reintegration of uh, detainees would be actively prepared from the start of sentencing through individual detention plans, a strengthening of uh, psychosocial services, and the further development of small scale detention projects for certain groups of detainees. For instance, parents with children, detainees shortly before release, young offenders, etc. And the minister's uh, policy statement took it uh, on board as well, and detention houses will be created in the next months and years. What delights me most is, the, is that uh, the government and its administration will operate these detention houses, and it will not be privatized. I think this is also very uh, important. Um, having explained the political support, uh, let me go over the need to, for social uh, support. This is a and essential to, to succeed. The message of small-scale detention and differentiation is not always an easy one. I believe that, that therefore communication is key, is very, very important. If you explain the functioning of the concept and its benefits, example given a greater chance of successful reintegration in, into society, people will listen and will understand. Uh, this requires repetition, and it is not always easy. You know the, the, the NIMBY syndrome, not in my backyard. It will certainly arise when projects take shape in little cities and in, in, in municipalities. Fortunately, more and more uh, mayors and local uh, politicians are starting to become believers. And that's why I was also glad that we normally should have had Mr. Uh, Mr. Magnet, who is a mayor in, in a big city, because their support is very, very important. Um, a push from well-known people can certainly help. Uh, one of them is uh, our, our famous actor, Matthias Schoenaert, uh, known from uh, the Danish girl, Mustang, Rust and Bone, and other uh, movies. He is an ambassador for Rescaled. And this opens doors and helps to get the ideas accepted by a wider uh, audience. So um, if I can um, come to, to some conclusions, um, launching new and especially innovative ideas and, and creating uh, social and political support for them is not always easy. But the ideas for detention houses clearly show that it can be done. There is one condition. And that's the condition you, you need to have in politics. You need patience, patience, especially when you're in the opposition. You need, you need to have patience, a lot of it. And fortunately, in, in politics, we are used to that. But above all, the uh, initiators must uh, not lose their faith and courage. And that, is, uh, and that has never happened. So to the super motivated people of Rescaled, the Hersen, uh, for them too, it has been a journey of, of, of 10 long years. And for this, I would also like to thank them warmly. Their pioneering work and enthusiasm deserve all praise as they inspired politicians to take this road. And their role was crucial. Uh, the three steps that uh, have been set along the road to a political support base are only a start. The real work starts now and continuity will keep on being crucial. 
Our uh, political engagement cannot stop here, and I have every intention to support every step in the right directions for, I hope, many, many years. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Mr. Van Hecker, for this uh, 10 years in seven minutes. Um, remarkable. Um, one of the things you say is you have to keep, uh, uh, it's a long-term strategy, but uh, how do you know that you're making steps? Because uh, you can't have a little bit of a house, so how do you kind of measure if you are on the right way or that you should adjust your strategy? Yeah, it's also important to have uh, information and proof. Um, uh, that's why we, we started by creating pioneering projects, because if you have these projects, you can learn from it, you can show the people what the advantages are. And we have also some, um, I, I think, uh, information from other countries. In Scandinavia, there were, uh, there were interesting uh, projects also. So this is very important also to use that information uh, and to have also the um, academic world uh, to, to study also and to uh, accompany the, uh, the steps we take. Um, so, uh, but you, convincing people, you will not convince people only by giving them that information. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, long, uh, a long work. Yes, it's, it's very long term. And in the Netherlands, the discussion is very little about effectiveness and facts. It's very much from a, um, well, I might even say underbelly perspective. It's very difficult to reason uh, in that. Is that also the case in Belgium? I'm afraid it, 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 it is, uh, and it was uh, certainly 10, 10 years ago. And like the questions you asked in, in the beginning, um, I think there, there is fear uh, because people don't know the system. They don't know the advantages uh, of it. And that's why you need, in fact, a long-term work. Eh? You need politicians who want to run a marathon and not sprints because uh, it takes a lot of time to convince people, to give the evidence, to, to, to go into discussion. If, if I can discuss with, with in, in 10 minutes or 15 minutes with, with someone, I can convince him. But to convince uh, some, so, some million people uh, in our country, that's, of course, a, a bigger effort. Uh, what I sometimes see with the activists who advocate for um, fundamentally redesigning our, our, our detention system is that they very much preach to the already converted. Uh, they, uh, they use words that work really well in their own world, but for, I would say, uh, voters and politicians that are more in the center, maybe less convinced, uh, they, uh, I'm sometimes wondering, oof, is this the wisest approach? Uh, did you sometimes have to alter your argumentation or your, your, your framing in order to also appeal to people who are not already convinced? Of course, it's important to use the, 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 the right arguments. Um, you know, in Belgium, we have some famous detainees. Uh, uh, for instance, Dutroux. Uh, if people think that Dutroux will next week live in the same street where they live with their children, uh, they will never accept, uh, accept it. That's why it's important to start a discussion with a category of det det detainees that are um, where people believe that uh, it is a good first step. Let's say, like like I told you, um, uh, first offenders, young people who are um, sentenced uh, and, and sent to prison. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, not a lot. There are women with sometimes with children in the, in the, in our prisons. We can start by you know, selecting these special types of, of prisoners to start these projects and to show that it works. So it's also step by step that you have to convince um, the people that these solutions are working and on the long term will be much better than the actual system. Okay, great. Well, we're going to talk more about the argumentations that we should be using in order to get more uh, support. Thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, yeah, then, uh, uh, Mr. Geens, 
uh, yeah, as you already said, you, you might not have been, you, you don't want to call yourself uh, uh, the founding father of uh, transition housing in, uh, in Belgium, but you are the one who made it policy. Um, uh, it, yeah, it's, it, it's a pretty, it's a new concept. As a minister, it's pretty easy to just uh, a little bit more of something and a little bit less, but you opted for a whole new, to introduce something new. That's not always the easiest thing to do. No, it is not. But of course, um, what you don't tell at the beginning of the story is, one, we will hold a referendum on this within two months from now. And second, what you don't do is say, uh, we will change the whole system from without. You just try to uh, gain support for a small scale project that might in the long run prevail. That is the tactics. Now, um, if you allow me, I will give you four elements uh, very shortly that were not in favor and four that helped. Okay. What was not, if, if you allow me, what, yes. what was not in favor is that we live more than ever, uh, although we say the contrary, we live more than ever in a society, certainly in Belgium, where every behavior which seems not wishable from a social cohesion point of view is penalized, is criminalized. All things that happen usually lead to some parliamentary discussion of let's make a new criminal law. And that endures for many years and it's worse than ever. Second, we have um, through social media and through much more active um, normal media, many more uh, trials by media than ever before. So um, people uh, in Belgium, the first quarter of an hour of public television at certain points of time is for uh, most of the time um, justice and criminal law and big trials. Three, um, magistrates in general have little interest for what happens in prisons, which is of course a problem because the end destination of many of uh, the criminal judgments is prison. And so there is a link which is not present. And um, you're looking for that link. It's very difficult. There are, of course, magistrates who are very active, but most of them are not. Fourth, if you want these days to have a new prison uh, in uh, an environment, that environment and its inhabitants are most hostile. So certainly when you create small detention houses in the middle of a city, this is a negative factor. That are four elements that are negative. What is positive? When you go to people and you tell them, listen, in the 18th century, um, the only uh, penalties that were relevant were the death penalty and all kinds of torture. And prison did not exist except as a place where one waited for uh, the death penalty or for torture. And people say, wow, and where were real prisons? Oh, they only happened in the 19th century. And then we were revolutionary. Europe, and especially Belgium, was a country where you had the most modern prisons in the whole world. Everybody came to look our prisons. Of course, we were a new state, a new constitution, new prisons. Most of our prisons still date back to the 19th century. So at that time we were new. Now we are very old because we still live in those prisons and we should look for a new method um, of detention, which is more adapted to uh, the uh, human rights uh, era wherein we live. And then people usually say, yes, we saw on television because there's a lot of interest of public television and even of private television in Belgium for what happens in, in, in prisons. We saw on television this and that. And yes, you're right, maybe even me, or maybe not me, but my husband could one day end up in prison. And therefore it's important because 
he was my husband at one point in time. So um, it's not only people whereof we think that they are criminals. There are also even parliamentaries in prison. There are people in prison, uh, MPs. Uh, there are medical doctors in prison. There are teachers in prison. Um, there are all kinds of people that end up in prison. And that's important. A third element which is important is that every man who is not, or every woman who is not for humane conditions, can see that at the end of the day, reintegration and successful reintegration is the best thing to do from an efficiency point of view. It's much less costly. We calculated that the prisoner in Belgium costs about 50,000 euros per year, um, which is not much. At the same time, it's a lot of money. So if you can tell people, listen, we can make that period shorter if uh, punition as such is not that important, but reintegration becomes the main element, then you get support, even from people who don't like prisoners to get released too soon. And fourth, you have, and that was what I started with, you have to tell to people it will be a slow process. We only start. It's an experiment. And we'll see, wait and see what it gives. And Hans Klaus, the real founding father, pleads for 900 detention houses, we will be at the end of this legislature, uh, the minister will tell later on, but uh, at the max of 10 or 15 uh, um, houses. So um, we have 35 prisons and we are still building new prisons of uh, 500 to 1,000 people, prisoners. So it is a slow process. It is not for tomorrow that uh, point omega will be reached. And that is also calming down public opinion. However, I must tell you that if one of those prisoners <coughs> who is not in prison anymore, but who goes to work, commits a capital crime, um, I'm very afraid because it will be trial by media again. And so the risk we incur if something goes wrong is enormous. Therefore, even uh, revolutionaries as, as I am, I think, but I'm not sure, uh, would plead for a slow pace in order to avoid that um, that small a child that was born incurs too many risks. That is shortly what I wanted to say. Wow. Uh, these are some very important factors. If I would uh, combine them, I would say they're all of them are not so much about political willingness or the ideas or uh, opportunities but really much about the public managing the public and working with the public opinion how crucial is that well it is crucial huh? because um politicians in general um and stefan uh, underlined uh, correctly that also right-wing parties are not against this project. Every politician who visited prisons is, if he is to some extent human, in favor of such an experiment. Um, however, um, he knows better than most other people the distance between what people think and between what politicians think. And you have to make them think them alike. And that is not so easy. Um, therefore, I told you television helps. If journalists tell uh, rather nice stories about what goes on in prison and how those people are and as personal conversations, if they show the humane aspects of detention, and um, if at the same time you show them some um, perspective. Huh? It's, it's not all um, uh, bad what happens in the world. And if you say, well, in the 18th century, there was still that. And now we're almost in the 22nd century. Should we not progress a little bit? Imagine, imagine that you would be in a hospital of the 19th century, or that you would send your children to school in the 19th century, and to those buildings, would you like that? And then in general, they say, no, 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 we wouldn't like that. Well, that is, that is what happens almost in, in our prisons. Uh, it's humane, it's not that, but it are not conditions of the 21st century. And, and then they start to understand. 
these are some very important arguments. If I compare the political debate in the Netherlands, uh, how do I say this in a neutral way? Uh, a Dutch comedian has called it PVV corvée, which means that center-right and slightly right politicians sometimes have to say super uh, populistic things because they're afraid otherwise people will vote for the very right-wing parties. So our Minister of Justice, he allows quite some experimentation uh, with our detention system, as long as it does not go into the newspaper and he is only in the newspaper uh, searching for drugs in prison or saying that he's going to make it tougher because they don't dare to, to say anything uh, that could be seen as soft and hence the discussion is not at all about effectiveness but just about who sounds the toughest. Why doesn't that apply to you? Well, it, it, it does apply to a certain extent to, to right-wing politicians who may have a certain double speak and are much more populistic in public than in private. So there is some schizophrenia, I think, in, in most countries as to that. Um, but I, 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 I join Stefan in saying that in the Committee of Justice, most parties, even the right-wing parties, not the extreme right-wing parties, there is always a difference between both, but are in support of, of, of a more humane detention. I cannot say that uh, um, any of those parties has, has ever... Uh, disappointed me. However, that will not mean that they will say it that publicly uh, as would Stefan or as, as I would do. And I would say even myself, I was um, not very, very, very outspoken on the issue, at least not, not as much as I wanted to, in order not to endanger the interest of my party. And that is so, normal. Uh, is it important if you uh, have politicians who are well willing but also have to in mind that they can't go too publicly on some things that as activists like the rescaled movement is that you sometimes shouldn't push your politicians too far or read a little bit in between the lines and uh, don't expect them to copy your words too much oh but they do i mean um i i never had a conversation with hans klaus and i heard part of his introduction um, wherein he did not understand to a great extent uh, what the uh, framework wherein politicians have to work, uh, what that framework exactly is and how difficult it is to defend uh, certain of those measures. Every time that a prisoner is released um, in a condition uh, that afterwards seems not to have been justified, because he is um, uh, again committing a crime, is for every minister a major problem. And so it is, it is extremely difficult um, to uh, walk on that thin line, um, which is the one we chose. But it is, it, it is worth being done, and um, we didn't mind to do it. And I'm very happy that the same goes for the new minister, if, who, who, if I may say, is a little bit more right-wing than I am. Yeah, but he, he posted on LinkedIn yesterday, sometimes prisons are not the best thing for people in detention. I was like, whoa, if the Dutch Minister of Justice ever posts that, uh, I will eat my hat, probably. Um, yeah, and he's a, he's a Christian Democrat as I am, and I noticed often that he is in an environment, the same goes for German Christian Democrats, by the way, that the environment they live in is more hostile to such initiatives than the Belgian environment. Okay, wow, wonderful. Um, uh, well, later we're going to talk more about uh, the arguments. Oh, I have one more question. It also comes in through the Q&A session. You said little steps. At the same time, you've also commissioned the new big prison in Haren, which is a big prison with over 1,000, uh, ready for over 1,000 people. Um, isn't it a bit in contradiction with your ideas of smaller scale that you also uh, started a very big scale project? Well, um, it certainly is not... Um very convergent, if that is what you mean. And it is certainly not convergent at first sight. I must first say the commission, uh, the prison of Haren was already um, ordered before I started. I only started building, uh, which is easy. I think a minister has to act in continuity or nothing ever happens in a country as ours. So you are obliged to follow. Nonetheless, I'm supportive of the prison of Haren since it are all small living units. It is like a, a big small city or a small big city. 
So if you would visit it, um, you would not see a traditional uh, Alcazar prison. Huh? Um, you would see something whereof you say, well, this is, this is worth living in. Um, of course, the, the proof of uh, the pudding will be in the eating, uh, and I don't know what it will finally give, but we could not afford to stop the um, uh, building program, Master uh, Plan Tree, as uh, Stefan said, because uh, our uh, building infrastructure is so old fashioned um, that we absolutely had to uh, construct new prisons. So I think it is N, N, uh, it's not uh, either uh, or, and um, it's important to see that that is part of that slow process. Such a prison lasts 40 to 50 years at least, but maybe by the end of the century, we will be where Hans Klaus dreams us to be, 900 detention houses. That is what I hope. But it yes. will be, it, it, it's a long shot. And okay. the same went, by the way, for the death penalty. It also took more than 150 years before the death penalty was uh, abolished in, in, in most of the countries. Okay. So it's small steps and patience, it's important. Okay, uh, uh, Mathilde Steenberger, um, so you're a member of the current cabinet of uh, the Minister of Justice, and uh, this uh, government has well, quite some ambitions. Small-scale detention made into the coalition agreement between the parties, and this year uh, two uh, smaller-scale uh, detention houses will be opened, and these are not transition houses for just the last 18 months. No, these are really uh, prison-replacing houses. Um, uh, how, yeah... How did this ever made it into the, the coalition agreement? Well, that went quite smoothly, I must say. Uh, we, we just suggested that uh, the first time that, that we should uh, go further on, on the part of the previous government with the transition houses. Um, and that we also have to do something um, not only in the end of the prison, but also for uh, execution of short uh, prison sentences. We should also do something in, in the same philosophy. Um, but like Stefan said, there was not really a debate. I think uh, the politicians are really uh, ready for that kind um, of, of prison sentences. Okay. That's, um, uh, it's, and it seems it, you also, it, it goes pretty fast if you're already opening the houses pretty soon. Are you in a hurry? Yes, we are in a hurry. Uh, we have a lot of surpopulation in, uh, in, in prisons uh, in Belgium, so uh, we really need um, new, new facilities. Um, and also the, the advantage of um, detention houses is that there are small buildings who, who exist already that we can reuse. So the moment we, we have our infrastructure, we, we just can start with it. So it doesn't take like five years to build a detention house like it needs uh, for a new prison. Yes. Um, when we are starting to building them and maintain them, it means you need a long-term funding, long-term strategy. So if, just, if it's a political hype, uh, you probably have a lot of resistance from within the system that you have to work with. Uh, what do you, does a system need from the, the political level that they know, oh, this is serious and this is not a hype, this is going to stay? We have to be serious about this? Well, um, organizations like Rescaled are a, a big help for us um, because then um, we, we have an organization who is really supportive and who is really pushing us uh, to go further. Also, scientists are also uh, a big help for us. And then we, we, we need just a, a lot of discussion. And like the other speakers um, already said, we have to take it step by step so that we don't, uh, so that we can start with little successes, um, not take too many risk, risks in the beginning. Like, uh, for example, like Stefan said, we, we shouldn't start with the life sentences. Uh, we can start with young offenders, with short sentences, uh, so that we first can help the, the public opinion um, to adapt to the new ideas and the new vision and, and to see that it can be a success and that it's positive um, for society and for security of society. Because we, have, we also have to, to speak more the same language and, and to respect the underbelly feeling. And we just have to name it and to tell them that it's also a way not just to uh, 
to loosen up. No, it's it's a, a way to to make uh, society more secure and more safe. And um, uh, is, is there more coming from uh, from, from this government? You think uh, are there new plans in the pipeline that you can give us a little uh, sneak peek preview from? Uh, we, we would like to um, to build ten detention houses um, during the the four years to come, and also the transition houses. We would like um, also to to go from two to ten. Wow. So in the end, that should be twenty. Um, that's a big ambition. Yes, and um, uh, if I'm uh, if I would say if I'm the, um, this is a very big political risk. If one house goes wrong, if one person escapes, if one person released uh, does something bad you have a big problem if everything goes well then uh, maybe you get a, a a nice conference about something a nice report not a lot of voters will vote for you again because it was such a success it takes a lot of courage to then take up this yes that's true <laughs> what can i say <laughs> no but uh well we uh, there's a, a big evolution in in thinking um we we like I said, it's it's also important to to make society more safe, and and to make society more safe, we have to make brave decisions. Because if we will only work with our underbelly feeling, um, then we won't make society more safe. Because then we will put everything everybody in prison, and then we will release them and back them back in prison. If we really want to help society to become safer, it it takes a lot of courage to go. Uh, against the underbelly feeling, but um, I already noticed uh, during uh, the last years that if if we take um, the necessary time to explain those things and if we go on the safe path, not not try to do this uh, with the most dangerous people, um, then people really when when they take uh, the effort to listen. Um, they really always see the advantage. I, I have never had a discussion if I had, if once I have uh, 10, 15 minutes time, I always can persuade people that, that it's a good thing to do. But you could have also opted for the, the approach of the Dutch ministry, which is uh, experiment and do new things, but don't tell the general public, keep it uh, a, a, a half a secret, so only tell the professionals, not the general public, and then maybe in 10 years say, Whoa, look what we have done and there were no problems with it. You actively look for uh, uh, you, the dialogue with society and support from the, from the public. Why do you choose that? Because there were uh, like uh, quite some um, security issues uh, with prison, uh, with inmates or ex-prisoners, um, who committed uh, new uh, new crimes? Um, there was a lot of uh, things to do uh, with um, uh, inmates who were radicalized in prison. Um, the, the prison environment is not very uh, supportive to start a new life, and we had quite a lot of uh, problems with that. So um, the public opinion also changed a bit, and and and. Now we, the public opinion sees that we have to do something about it. It's it, it's always stays difficult uh, to really um, really handle towards that. Uh, the, the most easy thing uh, is still put them in prison and forget about them. Uh, but we had quite a lot of issues, so the debate changed a bit in Belgium. So that we have to invest in. Um, in prisons um, if we want to make uh, society more safe and, and that that helps um, yeah that helps how for... important is it to have support within the system so prison directors uh, people who work in prisons uh, pe uh, people in uh, organizations around prisons is it important to have that support as well or can you just say look this is what we as politicians want just go do it no, no, it's, it's, it's fundamental that we have their support. Um, but I must say, I, I worked like 13 years in the prison. I, I know there's a lot of support uh, for alternative ways uh, of prisons because uh, when you work in a prison, it's it's uh, from time to time, it's very frustrating that you want to do things differently, but that it's difficult in an old-fashioned structure with old-fashioned um buildings uh to to really change things uh so i 
I am quite convinced, uh, and I know that we have a lot of support uh, for those new initiatives. And uh, I think there will be a lot of, of staff members who are waiting to go and, and work in detention houses to do it a different way. Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, good luck with all your endeavors and also uh, 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 this public approach. I think that's a very interesting approach. Um, in the second part of this uh, live stream, we want to uh, have a little bit of discussion. So we have uh, some questions are coming in. We're going to discuss them. And we have two dilemmas that we, as the rescaled movement, that we face. And one very important dilemma is that which argument should we use to get political support for this uh, transition from prisons to detention houses? And uh, I'm not, not so much talking about to the already converted, but how to convert new people, uh, people who might be a bit doubting or are afraid of... Uh, uh, the underbelly, which arguments should we use? And we noted a few down and you can divide a hundred points over this argument. So if you think one argument is the argument, give all your points to that or you divide them over some others. Uh, we have effect that effectiveness, so that uh, societies become more safe, it's better for uh, reintegration and less recidivism. The other ones is prisons fail, so we're not sure the new system works better, but one thing we know for sure, prisons don't work. Uh, the third argument, you could say it, it's more humane. So from the people in prison's perspective, it's better for how, how they feel. Um, the other one, you could say it's cheaper, or at least we're not wasting taxpayers' money like we do with the, with the expensive prisons. Um, it's the idea that sanctions should be in a society, not outside. So we shouldn't lock people away on an industrial zone some far away, but they should be in a society. Um, should you talk about the economic opportunities for communities? If there's a house in a community, it can provide services or buy bread from the local bakery. Should you say the innovation argument? Prisons are 200 years old. We haven't innovated that much. It's a standstill, so we have to move on as society. Um, or do you say it's, it's for uh, better working conditions for the people who work in prison? It's much better for them or safer or nicer if they work there. So you can divide your 100 points and we see effectiveness, humane, and uh, prisons fail are the highest, uh, and the prison staff is not the biggest argument. Yeah, if I look to our speakers, um, how would you divide your points? Uh, Mr. Van Hecke, what would you say is the most important argument? It's like the European Sun Contest, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Do the point, yes. <laughs> yes, uh, if I have a, uh, I must say there are very good arguments. There are many arguments. For me, the, the most important argument is it's safer in the long run. Uh, you, you give better chances for reintegration. And, uh, um, and, and the, sanction in, in, the sanctions are uh, in, in the society, not out of the society, but in the society. So I, I would give, let's say, um, about um, 50 points for um, safer in the long run, for about 30 pounds uh, uh, points for... Um, uh, better chances for, for integration and, and 20 points for um, sanctions in the society. Okay, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Geens, what would you, you already said something about your arguments, but what do you think are the most convincing arguments? Well, I think that once you have decided what we did in most countries to abolish death penalty, um, a sanction should necessarily strive for a successful reintegration. It makes very little sense to have people live in a prison for 60 to 70 years, which are uh, long life sentences where we are going to. That is completely absurd. So um, I like the safety argument, but I cannot guarantee it. It's clear that the human uh, imprisonment gives better results as to uh, people that commit new crimes. But, but Normally, Mr. Gens, if we look at uh, opinion polls, you see that roughly half of the society thinks people have done something bad can be teached or uh, helped to, to not do it again. The other half of the population is more skeptical on things. Once a criminal or a criminal, there's nothing we can do about it. So the only solution is lock them up as long as possible, as far away from us as possible, with high uh, fences as possible. Does then the reintegration argument also stick to those people? 
Well, um, I repeat, huh? uh, what, what those people say, I, I'm sorry, I hope uh, there are not too many right-wing voters listening to me, but that's, of course, complete nonsense uh, uh, to say, let's, um, let's incarcerate them as long as in any way possible. Let's kill them then, from the start. Uh, I'm sorry to be that tough. It doesn't make yeah. any sense. Yeah. So we should do anything in order to help them reintegrate one day, somehow, and if it doesn't work, then we have to keep them. We have a lot of internees, what we call psychiatric patients, who were committed to crime, who are lifelong. They are now in small institutions you know, where they have a long stay, just as in the Netherlands, for the rest of their life. That's humane, but not in an institution where you're five, six hundred in a prison. So it's a double path. Probably there are people who cannot be reintegrated, but we don't know that then at a very late stage, don't give up before they are 70 years old, I would say. I'm 63, so I have a reason to say 70. And, and uh, if they can reintegrate, do everything to make that possible. There is no zero risk in a society. And therefore, I hope that the first incident only comes after 10 years of small detention houses because then people will be able to live with it. But you cannot live without incidents. You cannot. So we're not sure it's going to work, but at least we have to try. Um, uh, Ms. Steenbergen, how would you, what would you say are the most important arguments? Well, I would like um, to put another argument um, to, the, to the list. Uh, I think it should be in addition to prisons. Maybe that's the biggest difference uh, between Rieskild and, and my opinion. I don't think we have to close all our prisons. I, am also, I also don't agree that prisons don't work. Um, we didn't invest enough in prisons, but when we would invest in meaningful detention, I think our prisons can work, uh, in addition with detention houses. Um, I think uh, it's uh, um, all, all the staff who's working in prisons uh, for, for many years, also with internees, but also with, uh, uh, with normal inmates, uh, are doing every day their best um, to help them, but the infrastructure, the, 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 the staff uh, is not um, rightly qualified, not enough um, to really help them and to do meaningful detention. I think we can accomplish a lot within our prisons as well. But so what, it should what, be what in addition say, to prisons. Would you say the, the, the idea of rescale that they say we want to replace the, all the prisons with detention houses mm -hmm. might be uh, endangering the cause of getting more detention houses? Oh, um, I, I think it, it, it could, it, it's not good for the underbelly, but it's always good that, uh, that there's an organization who is putting things very sharply. Um, but it, it's, if we as politicians would say the same thing, I think we would jeopardize the whole exercise. Um, because then the underbelly wouldn't be enough secured. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, uh, Mr. Van, van Hecke, uh, you said uh, so. Reintegration effectiveness is, is the most important argument that will win you. In the Netherlands, we had a, a, a debate in the parliament a few months ago about um, community servicing. You, you are not longer allowed to get community servicing if you pun, uh, punched a policeman or a, uh, an ambulance staff. And a lot of people were saying, Mr. Minister, what you're proposing is not effective, it will not lead to less crime and recidivism. And the argument just doesn't resonate because the proponents kept saying yes, but punching a police person is very bad. And then the whole, the whole effectiveness argument was swept under the carpet. How can you make the argument stick? I think uh, that, that alternative measures are very important. There's not only one answer to punish, punish. Yeah, because people think of uh, imprisonment, but imprisonment must in fact be the last last um, measure, yeah? the ultimum remedium, what they call. And that's also the idea of the uh, government agreement. So we have to try to find other solutions where possible. Uh, in Belgium also there's a possibility to, to have a work sentence and yeah? you do your work for the community. Um, you, you have uh, alternative measures um, someone who is um, uh, <laughs> a big danger on, on the street with a car and, and, uh, and, and causes a lot of accidents could be very, very, very uh, 
yeah, important uh, problem in, in, in our yes. society. Yeah, it's, it's maybe better to, to, to send him to the hospital and, and help for two months in the recovery uh, where people have to recover from, from, from very serious uh, injuries. So you have to find the right reaction to uh, a behavior that is not accepted. And the, um, I don't agree that the only reaction could be imprisonment. So that's a very, big, uh, that's very important. You must be able to make the argument uh, stick. Uh, Mr. Geens, we see uh, from the audience, they say a lot of people talk about uh, cheaper reintegration, safer, but also humane. It's more humane uh, than a prison uh, to do this. Um, would you say that is a very important argument to get support or is it a dangerous one because it sounds much too soft and like we, we want to be nice to people in prison instead of punish them severely? Well, it's important to be nice um, and sometimes nice to be important. But I, I think uh, it is a story you can make before uh, the public opinion. Uh, if you make them realize that their cells or their children abusing drugs uh, or having a heavy car accident could end up in prison. Everybody one day could end up there. I haven't meant to say that uh, our imprisonment at this time does not work. We have indeed invested insufficiently. The Netherlands, by the way, have invested much more but it's not because they have invested much more that the Dutch public opinion believes that the prisons function well. Whereas we in Belgium do have the impression that Dutch imprisonment works better and has less recidivism than Belgian imprisonment. So it is, it is always a difficult story um, to tell to the public and a lot depends on the climate in society. Uh, earlier on, you said our ministers would not tell in public what experiments they are doing. My question would be, and what if that experiment becomes public because it went wrong? I prefer telling about my experiments, if I may say so. Okay, that sounds like a, a wise advice. Um, I want to do a second uh, a dilemma that we have. Well, I, don't, I don't think that the amount of inmates that you allow into a detention house um, is, is so important to get the support. Uh, yeah, well, you, you don't have to exaggerate it. It has to be a small capacity, that's for sure. Um, it's... it's um, it's a... We, it's a... Um, uh, we don't want to, to put too much uh, limits in the beginning. So we, we, we are looking for buildings and we don't want to exclude uh, too much uh, before we start looking for buildings. So if we would say maximum of 30, we would already limit all the possibilities. So um, we decided to, to make it a, a wider range uh, for minimum and maximum capacity uh, so that we, we, we can choose the best projects and, and not... Um, to limit us too much in the beginning just because of capacity reasons. If, if we find a nice building um, who is really good for philosophy of detention houses but with 60 inmates, why shouldn't we do that? Um, we also have the real reality, don't forget that we have a, a circulation of over 10%. Um, if we can help as many inmates uh, to move to detention houses the quickest possible, uh, we should do that. So we, we said we, we take the maximum um, high enough so that we don't exclude too, too much in advance. Uh, well, I think it's, it's very important. Um, I think that it's, it's easier to find uh, support for a house of 20, 25 uh, people. I think the, the local politicians will uh, more easily will be able to, to support the idea 
uh, if it's a capacity of 20, 25 people, maybe a bigger city could be 40, but if it's getting too big, maybe it's too difficult to have, uh, let's say, to, 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 to select the group of, uh, of people you, you want to, um, yeah, to, um, to put in and, and to have a, a, the road to reintegration if there are too many. So there are a lot of arguments. I, I think we should not fix the, the, the minimum on, on 40. I think it should be lower and we will have more uh, possibilities to start and find houses, buildings uh, to, to, to start with it. Because I think I would give another answer or another question. If we have, for instance, a capacity of 10,000 people, if, if we make an investment in these detention houses, in the long term or in a couple of years, we should not only see that we go from 10,000 to, to 10,500 with detention houses, we should also try to lower the capacity of the traditional prisons that the transition houses or detention houses come in the place of the classic prisons. In the short term, this will be difficult, but in the long term, the capacity of the traditional uh, prisons should go from, let's say if we are at 10,000, we should go to, to, to 9,500, 9,000, because you have the detention houses who come in place. Because if you keep it on 10,000 and you invest in detention houses, you will create more capacity. And, and I don't think that is a good direction to go to, but that's a, that's a, that's a difficult dis discussion. For, for the detention houses, uh, we are we are just uh, doing it ourselves. Eh? Um, it will be like a, a normal prison um, staffed by our own staff. Um, we, we, we will um, look for other profiles eh? um, that would be social workers um, and uh, educational uh, staff. Uh, but uh, it will be our, our staff, so we won't give it to uh, non-profit organizations. Uh, with the transition houses, um, it's another story. Those those houses, um, we, uh, we we make contracts with non-profit organizations. Okay, um, I hope that my sound has, has been fixed now. Has no, it... no, not at all. <laughs> okay, we we are still going to try something to, uh, to to fix the sound. Um, I'm going to look at another question. Um, the broader public already been uh, said a lot. Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Geens, someone asks, why isn't it something that politicians can win votes with? We talked all about not losing votes, but how can you win votes? I'm, I'm certain you win votes, but you also lose votes. Um, and so to have a net win, a net profit is the difficulty. Um, I uh, met in uh, our prisons a, a very willing volunteer staff um, in, in almost every prison of people that can invest a lot of their uh, leisure in uh, a prison. So I really think there is um, a lot of people that sympathize uh, with politicians that try to uh, favor more humane detention conditions. But on the other hand, you lose. Uh, certainly when there is an incident. So um, you have to be sure uh, when you become a minister of justice that with your prison policy, uh, it's difficult to win any votes and then it goes much better. Okay. Um, yeah, you wanted to add something? No. Um, uh, is it isn't it a risk to start with specific groups that can count on the sympathy of society? So let's say uh, women or young people, 
Uh, is that also a risk? That people think it's only for the, let's say, lighter cases? Mr. Van Ecke? Um, you know, you have to start somewhere. And, and I think if you start with these first projects, um, this is a group that is very well identifiable. Um, I, I think also that there is, a, if you take first, first offenders, you, you can easily have a program uh, to, uh, to lead to, to a successful reintegration. So I think it is a good choice to do it. But uh, after, after a couple of years, you have to broaden the, the group uh, and maybe choose for more difficult um, group of, of, of prisoners or more complex uh, problems. But when you start it and you want to have sympathy and you have to, to, to find a lot of, um, let's say, social uh, uh, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so support uh, if you find if you want to find a good social support in the community, I think it's important to start with certain groups. But uh, when you work longer on on, the, on these projects, you have to to go further and, and select other groups also. That's true. Yeah, I think what, what, we, what we need are studies about recidivism, uh, but we also have to invest, and we are investing uh, in, um, in uh, gathering all, all the, the right uh, numbers so that they can do uh, a, a good uh, scientific um, research. Uh, but I think that's, that is really, really important, and what's, what could also uh, be... Uh, very handy is like now we have transition houses we will start with detention houses is to do a, a follow-up study um, um, why why not follow such a house for a period of a, a year or maybe two years and and maybe after five years then see uh, how how it goes with those inmates who, who passed uh, by a transition or a detention house so i think a, a lot of interesting studies are coming uh, in the next years Okay, so there's a, lo a, a, a lot that uh, uh, they can be doing. Um, uh, here we see uh, often prison terms have per uh, perversive effects if they are used for those people who would not have uh, received a prison sentence. Um, so how to prevent this in the case of detention houses? So if judges think more easily, oh, let's send this person to detention house because prison would be bad, but the detention house would be good, then we have created a new problem. Yes. That's one of the biggest, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. But we, we must say uh, the, the advantage of the system is that uh, it's not the judge who, was, who is sending you to a, a detention house. So that's one of the major things uh, who are very important to avoid net widening because net widening is, an, is, a, is a very big problem in everything we, start, we, we try to do. Um, but how we can avoid it is uh, we are not giving it to the, to the judge to decide if you are going to a detention house or to a normal prison, is the judge who is sending you to prison. And it's the prison administration who is deciding, are you going to a detention house or are you going to a prison? And I think that's the, the most important uh, way to avoid net widening because that's one of my biggest concern in, in everything we do with alternatives. Uh, what we see, uh, maybe that's also an interesting uh, research for our new criminologist who's in a in the room, um, that's to see how how net widening effects um, apply to, to society. Because when we started with um, electronic surveillance, uh, for example, well, what we see now is that everybody has to pass through that stage before they can go free. Um, and it's always like this: if we if we try to invent something new, uh, we see that a lot of lot more people are getting. Um, uh, or, or has to take this extra step and with alternatives to prisons, it's also like this. Um, 
if we if we started with probation, for example, um, I, I don't have the feeling that the, the amount of inmates increased. Now the, the amount of people who are getting sentenced um, rised. And that's a very big problem. Well, the strategy is never to, to ignore people, but if their arguments don't make sense and they don't want to discuss, which in general is the case on social media, uh, it doesn't help very much to discuss. Um, in parliaments, however, or in political debate, most of the people defending such a stance are people uh, whom you can discuss with and you can make arguments that make sense and they will listen. So you should not lose energy, in my view, with convincing people that are not open to discussion. But once they are, um, it helps, even if they don't agree, but just remain silent after uh, a certain period. Yeah, thank you, Rohit. Uh, and also you fixed the sound problem, so which is great. <laughs> our panelists, uh, a special thank to our panelists and uh, also you, the audience. Um, this panel has been extremely useful to us and we have learned a lot on building a political support base, whether that is for detention houses, but also for different things. The question is, of course, to us, is the political support that we are creating in Belgium support for the reskilled concept? Today, we have seen that some elements of that concept can become something different when polit policymakers try to implement this. These insights are very interesting and important to us. What also have been uh, confirmed is that the strategy for increasing political support entirely depends on the national penitentiary situation and political landscape. So however, today quite a few different approaches were mentioned and I don't think only one is the way to go. As we heard, it will be a combination of a lot of actions. Another fact that has been confirmed is that it is so important to ask policymakers what they need. If we, as an organization, can help them by providing information or building public support, then we have to undertake these actions. Therefore, today was also extremely useful to us, and we will try to use this information as recommendations for strategic decisions. I will know give the word to Noah for the last part of this live stream. And uh, once again, thanks a lot to everyone. Yes, hi everyone, thank you Manu. Uh, with that, we have one final question for the audience and our panelists. We are curious to your answer of the following question. What is your golden tip for organizations who want to start building a political support base? With this question, we are referring to the how and the way in which you can increase political support. An example could be a step-by-step -step strategy, or as we've heard before from Mr. Van Hecker, making the concept known via a known and famous ambassador. We would like to ask the panelists to think of one way that is most important to them, so the how. In the meantime, the audience can enter their answers on the right-hand screen as well. This can be a strategy that fits in the Belgian national context, or also a strategy that fits in your country's national context. I will give the floor back to Rohir so he can ask the panelists what their one important way is and tell us what the audience thinks. Uh, yes. Um... I said it before, I think you, go, you, have, you have to go step by step. Uh, that's, that's very important. Uh, and like I said before, uh, you, need a, you, have, you need a good condition. You must be a marathon runner because it takes a lot of time to arrive, to, to, make, to, to get to the finish. Um, and don't lose the, uh, uh, the courage because you, you need a lot of energy to, to fight for that idea that is very, very, very difficult to communicate with, 
with, with, the, with the community. So step by step and uh, a train for a marathon. Train for a marathon. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and I hope, uh, well, maybe another 10 years for you to be, uh, have made many more steps. Thank you also so much for all the things you've done for small scale uh, detention. Mr. Heinz, what would be your golden tip for a civil well, society organization? Um, I'm, I'm an old school uh, politician and lawyer. So um, I think that um, the step-by-step -step, uh, strategy is, of course, the best one, but that's not new uh, compared to what Stefan said. Um, I think you have to speak about it wherever you are. Um, and uh, I never um, missed a chance when I had an evening uh, uh, where I spoke uh, with uh, the general public or with opinion leaders or with junior or senior people of my party or with professors or whomever to speak about detention, humane conditions and alternatives. Same thing on television. Go on and speak about it until everyone has heard at least once what it is about. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, they will join you. But at the end of the day, which is, I hope, a very long day. Thank you. Keep telling you. Thank you so much also for your contribution uh, this afternoon. And uh, Ms. Steinberg, what, be your, what, be your, what would be your golden advice? I think the step-by-step -step is more for the politicians. I don't think you should go step-by-step. -step. Um, I think you should go all the way and, and let a compromise to the politicians, to the policymakers. It's good that the organizations um, have a, a clear path to go. Uh, you need a lot of patience and never give up is my golden tip. Um, but um, let the compromise thing uh, to the to the policymakers. It's good that an organization ha has a, a very sharp view on things. Um, you, you can be radical sometimes and uh, we will do the compromise. Thank you.